Good morning and a very warm welcome to church this morning from all of us at St John's, Whitley Woods and Clayton Brook Community Church. Welcome as always to our regular church family, to other friends and family members and anyone else who may have happened to join us this morning. And just a reminder as always again, our contact details will, will be up at the end of the service and we'd love you to be in touch. This morning we are thinking about the suffering church, about God's suffering people around the world and our fellowship with them. Uh, two of the mission agencies we support as a church, Barnabas Fund and Open Doors, uh, both work with and campaign for and support the suffering church around the world. And here is a great scripture as we begin, some words of Jesus written to a suffering church and it's about an open door. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And today we are praying for and honouring and standing with those wonderful people of God around the world who have not denied the name of Jesus. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Trouble, you lift me. 
Here is today's prayer for this last Sunday before Advent, uh, which is also a Sunday when we remember Christ as King, which is wonderfully appropriate for our theme today. So let us pray. Eternal Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King. Keep the Church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Now some notices and church family news. I mentioned Barnabas Fund and Open Doors. Uh, I do encourage you, if you haven't already, to look at their websites and uh, maybe to get their prayer diary. One thing we do at home, and I know a number of you do, is to pray regularly for God's suffering people using these resources. So I commend them to you, Barnabas Fund and Open Doors. As I said, next Sunday is Advent Sunday, which is really exciting, and it's that wonderful build-up to remembering the birth of Jesus at Christmas. Uh, you've had a letter from me about our plans for Christmas. Uh, thank you for a good number of offers for the Christmas choir, which have been coming into Paul. Please keep those coming. We've had a few offers for people to read and to be involved in the Nativity play for the children. Again, please keep those coming in. And then the lovely idea of the Advent boxes. And here's a message from Nick Brake to remind us and let us know what's happening there. Hello. Now, this year, things, as we know, have been a little bit different. And one of the things we're doing differently is the Advent in a box. But what is the Advent in a box? Well, basically, it's a box where you will build your own nativity scene and display it in your window. Now, at the beginning of lockdown, it was lovely to see uh, in people's windows all the rainbows that they had displayed. And we thought it would be really nice at Christmas time to do a similar thing, but with the nativity scene, complete with a little window sticker over the top. But how do you go about getting your advent in a box? Well, let me explain. So step number one is to send an email to Advent in a box at mail.com like this. Done. Easy. Step number two. Our friendly courier service will deliver your kit straight to your door before December the 1st. Hopefully. Step number three. Open your box and see what's inside. So in the boxes you'll find a variety of different things where you can build up your nativity scene as we work through Advent in the build up to Christmas. So for example, you've got these little wooden dolls here which we've painted, you get to decorate them yourself. And what we'd really love to see is every time you move on to that next stage through Advent, if you take a picture of your nativity scene and send it in to us because then we can share it on the Sunday services so everyone can see how their nativity scenes are building up over time. And remember, you've got that window sticker that you can put over the top and show that and display it in your window above your scene. And if you can think of anyone else who would love to do this as well, please do order one for them too, as they're completely free. And one other thing, uh, if all has gone according to plan, you will have had an email from me with a note about uh, changing service times when we come back together, we hope, in a couple of weeks time, but we'll see what the government decrees. Uh, but at the moment, with so many people under pressure, with lockdown, with illness, with people being uh, self-isolating and so on, uh, it's necessary for Paul or me quite often to preach at both churches. And in order to avoid a sort of undignified and, to be honest, disruptive rush from one to the other, uh, what we're going to do when we get, come back together until Easter, we'll run it until Easter as a sort of trial period and then take note, uh, we're going to have the service at St John's starting at a quarter to 10, 9.45, and the service at Clayton Brook at an hour later at 10.45, quarter to 11. 
Uh, PCC has uh, backed this change. It's not perfect for everyone. It'll be good for some and not so good for the others. But these are times where we're having to reinvent ourselves on an almost monthly, sometimes weekly basis. So I hope you'll understand and we'll make this work as well as we can. And now we come to confess our sins to God. Uh, we're thinking about people suffering because of persecution, but of course we also suffer because we bring it on ourselves by our sin. Uh, that's one of the reasons there is so much suffering in the world. And so it's good and right that we should confess to God and rejoice in his forgiveness. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy upon us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you to his image, to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the story of a Christian called Azia Bibi. She comes from a country called Pakistan, and she lived in a small village in the Shikapura district of the Punjab region. Azia and her family were the only Christians in the village. One day she was at work in the fields picking falsa berries when she was asked to go and fetch some water for everyone to drink. It was an extremely hot day in the middle of summer, and using a small metal cup, she drank some of the water. This is where things started to go badly wrong for Azia. The people of her village believed that all Christians are dirty and disgusting just because they're Christians. And because Azia drank some of the water, they refused to touch it, believing that they would be thought of as dirty and disgusting because of her. They became very angry and they began to argue with Azia. A couple of days later, one of the leaders of the village used a loudspeaker system to tell the whole village about the argument and what was said. Before long, an angry mob came to Azia's home and hurt her and her family. You might expect the police to come and help, but not in Azia's village. There, the mob took Azia to the police station, and the police arrested Azia for what she'd said during the argument and the police completely ignored what the violent mob did to her. She was put on trial, and the court sentenced her to death. Not for murder, or stealing, or any great crime, but for saying what she believed as a Christian during an argument at work. She was never even allowed to tell the court her side of the story. Does that sound fair to you? to be sentenced to death because of something she said. The government in Pakistan tried to step in and help Azia. The governor of her region, Salman Tazir, visited Azia in jail and he tried to help set her free. He wasn't a Christian himself, but because he tried to help a Christian, he was killed by one of the people who hated Christians. And he wasn't the only one. One of the ministers for the whole government, Shabazz Bhatti, who was in fact a Christian, also tried to help Azia. And he was killed as well. Azia was put into solitary confinement in prison. Because Christians were hated so much, the prison guards thought she might be hurt by the other prisoners. So they put her alone in a tiny cell like this. After 10 years in prison, Azia was finally set free by the Supreme Court of Pakistan. But she was in so much danger from the people that hate Christians that she had to leave her home and her country forever. This is just one example 
of the persecution Christians face all around the world today. That story about Asiya Bibi reminds us of something Jesus said to his apostles. He said, people will hate you because they hate me. Uh, the world so often hates the people of God because it hates God. And that's what Psalm 2 is all about. Uh, the world's rebellion against God, but God is still king of his world and he still saves those who come to him. We're going to read the words of Psalm 2 together now as a congregation. And after that, Alison will bring us our reading from Romans chapters 5 and 12. But first, Psalm 2. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he, in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem, on my holy mountain. The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them as an iron, with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities. For his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 11 and chapter 12 verses 6 to 13. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And now to chapter 12 and verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. 
Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. November 2020 is the month when, across the country, many people come together to pray for the suffering church, the persecuted church. When I started thinking about this, I was looking at what happens in some persecuted churches and it talked about churches being closed with the doors barred, that public worship was banned and no singing was allowed. There could be no social gatherings within the church. Sound familiar? So are we a suffering church? Do we actually feel persecuted? I'm going to read you a quote from a wonderful book that I've read twice now called God and the Pandemic and it's by Tom Wright and it talks about in a time of acute crisis when death sneaks into houses and shops when you may feel healthy yourself but you may be carrying the virus without knowing it when every stranger on the street is a threat when we go around in masks When churches are shut and people are dying with nobody to pray at their bedsides, this is a time for lament. We do need to lament and feel sad about what's no longer there, but we shouldn't be looking back and blaming anyone, especially God, for what is happening. We should be looking forward to see what we can do to move God's church, God's kingdom forward. Our reading from Romans today talks about us having different gifts. So Romans 12, 16 to 13 begins, We all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generously. What better example could we ask for? Tom Wright talks about, as a church, that we need to be thinking about who has been most affected by our current situation. And then, what can I do to help? And who can I send? Or do I need to go myself to help? The early Christian church didn't look back and blame God for their persecution or all the terrible things that were happening to them. They looked forward to see what they could do to move God's kingdom forward. In Romans 5 verse 3 it says, Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character hope. And that this in Romans 8, 16 to 17, it talks about if we're children of God, we are also heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with the Messiah, Messiah, as long as we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The early Christian people astounded the population around them because they didn't sit back and ignore suffering. They responded. They asked, what needs to be done here? Who can I reach out to? Who is most at risk? How can we help? Who shall we send? They fed the hungry, cared for the old and sick. They spread the gospel and nurtured faith in others, even at the risk of their own safety. So as a church, we are thriving You only have to look at the numbers of people who watch the online service each week. We can thrive even now in the midst of a pandemic. We can speak out, we can reach out and we can gather in for Christ. And we can do it now. There's no point waiting till all this is over. We need to do things now. 
So let us step forward in faith and do whatever needs doing for those people who need help and support. Step forward and volunteer to do those phone calls to the lonely and the depressed. Step forward and do that course that will prepare you to be a better leader in our church. Step forward and make those cups of coffee. Make those shoe boxes. Remember people. Step forward in faith. So when we talk about the suffering church, the persecuted church around the world, what do we mean? Because this is the real lockdown. Where churches are persecuted, churches are closed. The doors are locked because the authorities have locked them. People can't say the words of a service out loud or sing songs out loud for fear that someone will hear them and report them to the authorities. One of the charities, the missions that we support as a church is called Open Doors. And if you look on their website, there are some amazing stories about the suffering that does take place around the world. This is a map that identifies the countries where people are persecuted, where Christians are persecuted just because of their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a list of some of the countries that do persecute, the worst being North Korea. And it's scary. It's amazing to think that so far this year, over 3,000 people have been murdered because they are Christians, because they profess a faith in Jesus Christ. Millions of Christians around the world are being persecuted for their faith today. In India, they're attacked by extremists who are emboldened by their government's hardline views. Chinese churches are seeing their buildings torn down and pastors are being arrested. While in Nigeria, the slaughter of Christians by armed militant groups continues unabated. One of the stories on the Open Doors website describes the experience of the family of a little boy called Samir, who was a joy and delight to his family. Tragically, last July, he died from an illness that he was born with. He was 11 years old. But just four days after his funeral, Samer's parents were forced into doing the unthinkable to remove his coffin from the grave that they had bought and paid for. It's a rare and awful thing for a parent to have to remove a coffin, the coffin of their child after burying it. But that's what they had to do. The family first discovered there was a problem when Samer's father went to the register his death and the officials told him that he wouldn't get a death certificate until his coffin was removed from his grave. As a Christian, they didn't want him buried so close, not in, but so close to a Muslim cemetery. Samer's father argued with them, but because they'd legally bought the land and they bought it as a cemetery but they wouldn't give him a death certificate. Back home the police were waiting for Mark, Samer's father, and they arrested him for burying his son illegally. They didn't take into account the circumstances of his situation. They insulted him and they dealt with him badly. Mark ended up having to go to court and in the end, they had to dig up this child's body from the grave that they had bought and take him to a cemetery over a, a hundred kilometres away from their home. So how do we move this forward? What happens in persecuted churches? Well, the people in persecuted churches are not blaming anyone. They're not blaming God for their misfortunes. Like the earlier Christians, they're looking forward to see what they can do to move God's kingdom forward. And equally, what can we do to help persecuted churches? Well, a good starting point is the website, the Open Doors website, where we can find out more. 
we can find out more about families who are being persecuted and we can find out more about how to help them and we can share that information with other people. Very importantly, we can pray for the work of charities like Open Doors and help them help other people. And we can write to persecuted Christians, sending them a message of hope. We can help them financially. £22 can provide a Bible for someone who is facing extreme persecution. £52 can provide medical care for people, for two victims who've been left traumatised and bloody on streets, left to die. £64 can help support a persecuted family by giving them an aid package that can help them survive the next few days. Your support, our support, my support can help persecuted Christians continue to courageously follow Jesus. Together we can reach those who are persecuted where persecution hits hardest. Jesus said, come to me all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light.
We're going to say together now the words of the Creed. And it's good to remind ourselves that these are the beliefs which are shared by God's church around the world. Uh, it may be worth just mentioning when we say, I believe in one ho the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, we're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about Catholic as in world, worldwide, one people of God. And of course, also, these are the beliefs for which people are dying today because they hold fast to this God. So let's join with them and stand with them as we say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who live in it. Praise to you, Lord, for your blessings to us. May your name reign mightily throughout our world. Lord, we have much to bring before you in prayer. We pray for an end to this pandemic, Father, as we look forward to a safe vaccine in the very near future. But the real light at the end of this tunnel, Lord, is not a vaccine or a testing program, but the one true light of Jesus Christ. And we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. During this second lockdown, Lord, we pray for our government and all in leadership, that the right decisions are made for the good of us all. We pray for those who live alone, for those who have lost their jobs, that we may all keep in touch and reach out to them wherever needed. We pray for the NHS and other key workers. They deserve our most grateful thanks, Lord, and your greatest blessings, for where would we be without them? We pray for our schools and colleges who are still open during this lockdown. Our children need to learn and need stability in their young lives and their teachers and other staff need to be kept safe. So we pray for your strong protection to be over them all, Lord. And we pray for our sick, for those who have the virus, for those undergoing other treatment, and for all those known to you. Lift their names up to the Lord. And for Diane Jones, we pray for your mighty healing for Diane, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray today for the persecution of Christians worldwide. At the very top of the World Watch list is North Korea, where Christians have to go underground to hide their faith from public view. Other countries such as Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, and there are many more. Here Christians have lost their homes and their jobs and even their lives. Family, friends and neighbours will often attack someone who has converted to the Christian faith. And in Nigeria, China and India, churches are actually being destroyed. Lord, all of this saddens us greatly. It makes our faith seem weak and meek compared to theirs. And what it does to you, Lord, and to Jesus, who gave his life for all people, is something we can't even think about. We pray for your protection over our persecuted brothers and sisters, Lord, so that food and shelter can be found for them in a place of safety. We pray they will not waver in their faith 
and those who have lost family members, we pray they will be greatly comforted by you. The strongest protection comes from you, Lord, and from our prayers. We can't all afford to give, but we can all afford to pray. Prayers are free, but bring the greatest reward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves and for Philip and Paul, for our bishops, PCC and church wardens, and for our St John's Church building, which is in a dire state at the moment, Lord, with all the scaffolding. Lord, we pray that you will sustain each day of ministry and any decisions and will bless and keep safe each one of these special people. Nothing is more important than following you, Lord, and your desire is that we know your peace and your presence in our saddest, in our loneliest and in our happiest of days, Lord. And with you as our main source of strength, we can make sure that Jesus is firmly included in the rhythm of our daily lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And now can we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, many thanks to everyone for their contributions today, to Cathy, uh, to Paul, to Kath, Alison and Nick, and also to our musicians from both churches. Uh, we're deeply grateful to you all. Just a reminder that at the end of the service, our contact details will be up in front of you. Uh, there should also be on the YouTube page a link to our Zoom coffee. And we'd love you to join us. It's a lovely opportunity to chat together after the service. Please do come and join us for virtual coffee. And don't forget Barnabas Fund and Open Doors. Uh, do be uh, informed and prayerful for them. We've been thinking both last week and this week about God's church throughout the world. Uh, Jesus loves his church as a bridegroom loves his adored bride. Uh, in a moment, we're going to sing, I think, these beautiful words about our Lord Jesus. From heaven, he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood, he bought her and for her life, he died. You'll need to get your skates on. Our organist is a little bit on the quick side, but let's sing together now. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in us that which is pleasing to him, to the praise of Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of this almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen.